You know, we've, we've titled this. I'm glad y'all can't see everything that goes on my screen when I flip that thing over. It just goes nuts. I've entitled this series, Not of This World. I was standing over thinking a minute ago, I maybe should have entitled it, Things Nobody Else Will Preach. But I'm dumb enough to go ahead and do it anyway. Uh, uh, so I, I don't know. But this morning we're going to talk about becoming otherworldly. If if we're not to be of this world, then we know how we need to learn how to become otherworldly. And we have already talked in this series that there are uh, two worlds around us. Uh, there's there's the natural world and there's the spiritual world. And the natural world is everything that you and I see, feel, touch, taste. It's all the things that we go through in the natural realm. I don't ever want you to not think that those things aren't reality, that they're not real. They are. Faith is not denying the existence of something. Faith is just believing there's something more to overcome what we face in the natural. All right, because everything else that just gets into spooky, weird mind science. It's just it's not godly. It's not it. This this you can pinch yourself and see if you're alive and well, well maybe not well but alive. But but that's real. That flesh is real. I'm not saying it's not. What I'm saying is, and what the Bible is saying is this: is that there's another world that's more real than the one that we live in, and it is actually the one that influences the things that go on in the natural world around us. And uh, that that world is is divided up into what is the kingdom of God, which is far superior, far far greater, far larger, uh, and includes everything that you can see and can't see. But there's a usurper in the world today, and his name is Satan, and uh, he has what's called the kingdom of darkness. And the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light are at war, and you and I are caught in the crossfires. Okay. So if you ever think that you're, if you ever think you're going to get out of the fight, I, I just want I, let me be the first to bust your bubble. There's always going to be a warfare going on around you. Life itself is just hard, at times, right? Let's let's deal with reality. That's why Jesus came. Jesus came because things weren't right, because life was hard, not because God created it to be that way, because man and 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 the devil messed everything up. So the Lord has been in the process of of bringing things back into what should be the right way things happen. And we've been talking about that. This morning I want to talk to you about the subject, Becoming Otherworldly. So turn in your Bible if you've got them and we'll, we'll read it here. I've actually got this up here on the overhead for you this morning. Out of the Gospel of John, chapter 12. This is actually in the context of um, what we call Palm Sunday. Uh, when Jesus came riding into Jerusalem, um, if you can receive it victorious on a donkey colt. Imagine the King of kings and Lord of lords riding in on a lowly donkey. And yet that's what Jesus did. And He has had some Greeks come to His disciples, one of His disciples, and said they'd like an audience with Jesus. They'd like to talk to Jesus. And uh, I didn't put this up here to read it because it was just more than what the screen would hold. Number two, I didn't want to get too deep into it anyway. But it's funny because the disciples came to, um, the Greeks came to one of the disciples and he didn't just go to Jesus and ask. He had to go to another disciple and the other disciple had, had to both go to talk to Jesus. And I was sitting there and it just made me chuckle because it's so much like us. We, we, we can't just go straight to Jesus with things. We have to go to somebody else to talk to them about it before we go and decide we're going to go with Jesus. And I'm already preaching real good now and I'm just already going to meddle and I haven't got started. But I, I don't understand why people just can't go to Jesus first. Rather than go to somebody else and say, we got a problem. we got a bunch of Greeks. Remember... In the eyes of Jews, Greeks were heathens. They were considered right on the same level with dogs. So when they wanted to have an audience with Jesus, I can just, this, this, this disciple that was approached, I can imagine, oh, they want to see Jesus. They want to meet with Jesus. Oh, I better go see what so-and-so thinks about this. So they go get another disciple and they talk about it and they say, well, let's go, let's go take it to Jesus. And 
Jesus comes back with these words in John 20, 12 and verse 24. It says, Truly, truly, I say to you that anytime you see truly, truly in the Scriptures, it's with emphasis. Jesus is about to give something with great emphasis. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. He who loves his life loses it. And he who hates his life in this world will keep it to eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. Now let me just deal with verse 25 first there where it says, He who loves his life, he who loves his life loses it, and he who hates his life in this world will keep it to eternal life. We need to understand something about that because we need to understand how, how the Jews communicated and, and how Jesus knew that what he was saying was being received rightly. Because Jesus has already told us that the two greatest commandments in the New Testament are what? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, body, soul, and spirit. And what? Love your neighbor as yourself. So a couple of times Jesus uses the word that you have to hate your own life um, to follow Him. In the Hebrew, what that means is this. It's, it's setting priorities. It, it does, it's, it's making a contrast. Um, weak-minded, controlling, religious people might take that and put a huge weight burden upon the people that, that Jesus doesn't want you to carry. It's not about hating your life. Jesus came that you might have life and have it more abundantly. The question is, what kind of life is that supposed to be? And how do you get it? So Jesus is drawing a contrast here. He is prioritizing things. He is saying, I must be first in all things. If you really want to have life and have it more abundantly, John 10, then you're going to have to hate the world that's around you in the sense of you're going to have to put away everything that's in the world so you can take on everything that I have. You're going to have to give up every fleshly thing, and we're going to talk about it and explain it more as we go through this, and take on the spiritual, the heavenly thing, so that you can have eternal life. Everybody with me? So now we've dealt with that one. Now let's get to meat of what I've got for you this morning. Because I'm, I'm really excited about, about what the Lord's given me, even though it's another one of those things that's, that's kind of tight, but we'll, we'll see how we do. Because you see, here's the issue. The way into the kingdom is not through life, but rather through death. Now, I know you, you've been told and you've heard a lot about just becoming a Christian and going in and just continuing with the same kind of party, the same kind of lifestyle, that, that kind of thing. That's, that's not how you enter the kingdom according to Jesus. The way into the kingdom is through death. Death to this world is required to enter the blessings of the other world, which is the kingdom of God. Now, I know that that doesn't make sense, but it's the way of another world. Remember, I've already told you in a couple of other sermons that if it looks good in the natural, it's probably not right in the supernatural. If it makes sense in the world, it's probably not the sense of heaven. I've already shown you, I mean, we've all heard this and, and we've said it and, and there's a time and a place for it. God doesn't want you to go off being stupid. He gave you a mind. He gave you something to think with, all right? But the things of heaven don't always make common sense because they're of another world. Now, once you get into this other world, once you get into the kingdom of God and you begin to renew your mind a little bit, you begin to understand that the ways of the kingdom are higher than the ways of the world. And you begin to understand and you begin to practice and you begin to see the fruit of what you practice that it's better to give than to receive. That it's better to forgive than hold a grudge. That it's better to pray for our enemies than it is to go after them. 
So that, that's what I'm talking about here. This is, this is how we have to get into a, a different mentality and, and, and a different mindset. And we have to die to certain things to be able to live. Jesus had to die to make a way into the kingdom for us. And he used an agricultural term. Let me, let me back up here. He, whoops, he used a well. There's where I want to go. He used an ag- agricultural term or an example here when he said, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies... It remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Now, I, I just thank God for being raised on a farm because there's so many spiritual truths that are in that. But in that day and time, seed that was just out or seed that was being held was called a bear seed. Not B-E-A-R, but B-A-R-E. Bear seed. So to have a sack of seed that wasn't in the ground was to have bare seed. Why'd they call it bare seed? Because it wasn't producing. It was only good for consuming, not producing. And most Christians, I shouldn't say most, many Christians are bare seed. They're there for consumption. They're there to consume. They're not there to produce. Why? Because nobody's willing to die. Nobody's willing to die to self. Because you see, before the, the seed can become fruitful, it has to be put in the ground and literally rot so that it can germinate. It used to just make me nuts when I got older and I understood that when Dad would go spend thousands and thousands of dollars on corn seed. And then we would put it in the ground. And I didn't see seeds going in the ground. I saw dollars going into the ground. When I got old enough and, and, and I saw thousands of dollars going into fertilizer and I saw thousands of dollars going into equipment and I saw thousands of dollars going into everything that it took to keep that crop and, and to keep it free from disease and from, from pest and hours and hours and hours of working that crop over months of hot, sometimes dry conditions in the summer. But every fall I would understand why we put the seed in the ground because every one of those seeds that went in the ground produced, multiplied over what they were while they were just bare seed. And many of you in here have no idea how much fruit you can bear for the Lord if you just die to self and let Him do what He wants to do with you. But we don't like to talk about dying, do we? Nobody likes to talk about about death. And yet death is the way in to the kingdom. Jesus had to die to make a way for you and I to get into the kingdom. His example of getting into the kingdom after sin was placed upon Him was to die. He died, was put in the ground, put in the grave... And then three days later arose. He has done... uh, Lord, you're going to have to help me with this. He has done more since He arose than He did His entire life upon the earth. Well, that some of you going... No, he's, He's done far more since He died and arose than He did since He was here. Why? Because He has borne fruit in multiple millions and millions of people through the ages. Countless signs of wonders have still been done through God's people through the centuries. Jesus said, the works I do, you'll do, and greater works than these will you do because I go to the Father. We, we, we sang a worship chorus this morning. I still believe, do you? Do we? Because if we do, then there ought to be things happening around us. 
And, and, and the greatest miracle, period, is the miracle of a newly born again believer. There's not, nothing greater than that. And, and every miracle Jesus did and everything that